The 400,000 ethnic Chinese living in Venezuela, one of the biggest oil-rich countries in the world. But in recent years, a sluggish economy and violent protests have plunged the country into chaos. Tens of thousands of ethnic Chinese have returned to their home provinces in China. Most of them were from Enping in Guangdong province. Since the 19th century, their ancestors from Enping, Kaiping and Taishan have left their hometowns in large numbers to work abroad. Many of them continue to support the economy in their hometowns. Now some of them are coming back for good. But life back at home is not always easy to get used to. Lang Lintao lived in Venezuela for 24 years, becoming a naturalised Venezuelan citizen. He's now returned to his hometown. Uh, Feng Xieting abandoned her business and went back to China, even though she has a strong sense of belonging to Venezuela. Mingo Zhang made a very quick decision to depart when he realized that the political atmosphere had turned tense. But for some migrants, coming back to their hometown might not be a permanent decision. Some of them are hoping to go back to Venezuela if the political or economic situation improves. Okay, so um, this video is meant to illustrate how um, remigration reverses so called. Uh, oops. How remigration reverses origin and destination sites. And while the video focuses on the Chinese in Venezuela, um, there are similarities with uh, the Chinese in Canada who remigrated uh, that I have conducted research with. Let I me just turn you. it off. China's diaspora outreach uh, tends to portray the Chinese abroad as members of an extended Chinese nation, naturalizing belonging community. By the time that co-ethnics have lived abroad forges hierarchies of difference, uh, both for first generation and diasporic descendants. And studying the hierarchies of difference amongst co-ethnics requires a different set of analytical tools, uh, drawing out, for example, distinctions to do with nationality, okay, um, the Chinese who naturalized in Canada, New Zealand, Venezuela, etc., um, as well as the time of migration and the notions of uh, human quality uh, or suchi. 
So again, I want to come back to this uh, dating game show, Fish and Ura. I just find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, so in another episode, there was an American-born Chinese contestant who was featured. And in his introduction video, uh, he shared that he regretted not learning Mandarin properly as a child because China is now so formidable. Li Hai is the term he used. And examples like this, okay, as circulated in um, the media, suggest that the Chinese abroad continue to desire and in fact aspire towards belonging to the Chinese nation. When in fact, alterity is exercised flexibly by different groups of co-ethnics. And hierarchies of co-ethnic difference are rife amongst the domestic-born Chinese and Chinese diasporic descendants, including those from Taiwan, Singapore, and Myanmar. So in the book, I interlink uh, two examples of how co-ethnics perceive uh, another group of co-ethnics. Back in the 1990s, geographers Brenda Yeo and Katie Willis carried out interviews with Chinese Singaporeans living in China. This was the late 1990s. Huh? And they saw uh, the Chinese Singaporeans living in China saw their mainland Chinese counterparts as uh, a group that was more backward. Uh, and some even said quite strongly, um, uh, depraved. So one of their interviewees said, uh, the cultural revolution has harmed China. The country has lost its character, its culture. It doesn't have a soul. Many customs we keep steadfastly in Southeast Asia are not practiced in China. Um, so I wanted to juxtapose that kind of um, articulation of co-ethnic difference with another one uh, based on fieldwork that I've conducted uh, more recently. So fast forward to today. China's accelerated development now places it in a superior position to neighboring countries like Myanmar. In another, um, so for example, in the second um, interview uh, quote that I share here, uh, it was from, it was taken from an, my interactions with a, a mainland Chinese businessman who uh, works at the China-Myanmar border in Reili. Uh, he was actually from Fujian province and then moved to Reili in Yunnan province um, to carry out business. And he himself actually has ties with uh, Myanmar. His great-grandfather had migrated uh, from China to Yangon, um, Rangoon at that time, uh, to set up a business, was quite successful, but subsequently decided to re-migrate to China, and he brought some of the family members with him. So uh, my respondent was um, one of those who went to China uh, with his, um, uh, who grew up in China as a result. So when I was uh, talking to this mainland Chinese businessman about his ties with Ch um, Burma, he, he said, you know, that uh, he could, even though he had tried to live in Yangon for a period of time, he felt that he could not adjust. And he described it in this way. He said that um, the Burmese Chinese uh, or the Burmese people, you know, they wear the long jeans, it's like a sarong, um, a cloth that you wrap around your waist, and they wear slippers. Uh, he was not used to it, he said. You know, the mainland Chinese tend to wear covered shoes. And in the book, I suggest that um, this was actually... Uh, an analogy, okay, because covered shoes symbolize higher levels of development, they cost more, and they signaled attentiveness to decorum and style, whereas open toed slippers were inexpensive and shabby according to the mainland Chinese. So, in another chapter on Singapore, I mentioned as well that uh, the PRC immigrants in Singapore today, they continue to be viewed negatively by the Singapore Chinese, identified by the way they dress, they they speak and they behave. Coming together, these different attributes coming together flexibly and mutually constituting one another, uh, perceived then as this idea of su zhi, human quality. So in the cases mentioned, um, the attributes okay, that become attached to su zhi are actually reflections of geopolitical and developmental perceptions of a co-ethnic human quality. And these examples show, uh, as historian Shelley Chan has argued, uh, Shelley is actually here with us today, diasporic moments or the so-called encounters between co-ethnics can deepen identification or accentuate difference. So my third and last argument, and I would just have enough time to do this, uh, it observes that alterity can be spatially recalibrated through migration. And my example here is of the Shao Shu Min Zhu Hua Chiao. Okay, in English, these are the ethnic minority overseas Chinese. This is a new category uh, that has uh, gained importance in the eyes of uh, the Chinese state. And here I draw on research done by China study scholars such as Eleanor Barabasantova and Chris Vasankuma to illustrate my argument. 
In recent years, China has expanded its diaspora strategies from focusing on the Han Chinese to also include ethnic Ch minorities who have emigrated and diasporic descendants as well. The example that Elena Barabasenva provides is of the Dungans in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, where China has started roots tourism initiatives. Accordingly, in her research, one such visitor to China was so impressed by the development he saw in China uh, that he commented, um, uh, he not only had China developed um, uh, in an accelerated way, but uh, he was also appreciative of the way their minority culture had been preserved in China. So this Sojin work uh, carried out builds goodwill amongst the ethnic minority overseas Chinese and extends China's reach into underexplored economic territories as part of the One Belt, One Road initiatives and beyond. The ethnic minority overseas Chinese are emerging as new targets of policy work done by diaspora engagement agencies, such as the Tiaolian and the Tiaopan. And the newest diaspora, diaspora engagement recalibrates alterity through migration by extending membership fraternity to the ethnic minority overseas Chinese. So by journeying abroad, the ethnic minorities overseas Chinese acquire greater recognition in the nation state uh, only if it reinforces the state's version of history, identity, and nationhood. So this presentation has focused on drawing out the multi-directional aspects of migration in and of China. In the book, I actually use the term contemporaneous migration, okay, which um, captures the idea of space and time to further conceptualize the mutually, mutually constitutive effects of space and place. Um, contemporaneous migration is a mouthful, so I tend not to use it in my presentations, uh, but it seemed like a good idea when I was writing it. Overall, what I sought to show here is the social ordering of ethnicity within a nation and how it extends to global space through migration. At the same time, such social orders are made more complex through migration. And I illustrate such complexities by discussing three manifestations of alterity. First, on phenotypical difference to do with skin color. Secondly, on the diversification of difference amongst co-ethnics. And thirdly, the spatial recalibration of difference to do with ethnic minority emigration. For geographers and other social scientists, uh, contemporaneous migration draws out, first of all, the spatiality of temporality. So here, I'm referring to how spatial narratives that emphasize past ties, past ties, so the time factor to the ancestral land, in fact, actually capitalizes on notions of territory and extending membership beyond the nation state. Uh, secondly, the temporality of spatiality, how time matters in the organization of space, and flows of people across space. So here I'm referring to how temporal hierarchies uh, come to play, uh, and these have to do with so, uh, notions of development and human quality, su uh, as they constitute new axes of social difference. So I want to end by talking about how contemporaneous migration also uh, can be read as a method. Okay, to me, it is not just a conceptual framework, it's actually a vantage point in terms of how we carry out research. So how would we operationalize our research on multi-directional migration from such a vantage point? And I share two approaches. So the first could be to study how migration trends that are normally treated separately, such as emigration and immigration, they actually take place within a site simultaneously. So here what I've done is I've identified a site as the hub of inflows and outflows. And across the different chapters, I look at China, Singapore as well as Canada as uh, migration hubs where these emigration and immigration flows uh, coexist. But there are many more such migration hubs where both emigration and immigration coexist, uh, such as in India, Malaysia, and even other regions of the world. Uh, it, using such a vantage point, immigration serves as a lens to analyze emigration, and emigration serves as a lens to analyze immigration. And in doing so, it reframes citizenship debates or assumptions that we have about citizenship in both immigration and emigration. Such an approach would interface the roots and experiences of different social groups within a site and in connection to elsewhere. The second approach um, where we can use contemporaneous migration as a vantage point it would be to study the multiple migration routes that migrants undertake across migration sites, so therefore the interconnections across migration sites. 
Doing so would mean identifying an analytical connection, such as the focus on Chinese migration and remigration that I have shared in my presentation. But equally, we could look at other kinds of migrants, including from India, the Philippines, etc. So doing so challenges assumptions we have about which is the migrant sending or, and which is the migrant receiving country, which is the home or which is the destination culture. It doesn't fix um, or, take, or treat these sites as static um, uh, points of analysis. Such an approach draws out the discourses, policies, actions and events that would be otherwise normalized if such migration was studied in isolation. Oh, um, okay. This is fine. So um, in my, this is really my concluding slides. Okay, as a research agenda, contemporaneous migration focuses attention on multi-directional migration routes as they converge in the national territory or forge interconnections across global space. Uh, its contributions include extending knowledge on how migrants aspire for recognition and rights in different countries across the life course. Uh, and this is what I want to emphasize across the life course. The second point, drawing out how states, migrants, and non-migrants flexibly exercise claims to membership or social difference, what I call alterity and fraternity as two sides of the same coin. Third, eliciting how migrant rights are constituted by citizenship norms and policies in both countries of origin and settlement. Bearing in mind, of course, these sites could be reversed when we are studying remigration. So this is what I consider um, citizenship constellations. And lastly, bringing to view the new inter-ethnic and co-ethnic tensions that are emerging between past and present cohort of migrants. So with these thoughts, I conclude my presentation.